Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we will dive into how to use hypothesis testing to solve real problems. Specifically, how to use hypothesis testing to analyze results of A-B testing. I will give you two examples and show you how to solve them step by step. This video is part two of cracking hypothesis testing problems in data science interviews. In part one of the video, we went through a few commonly used hypothesis tests, when to use them, and what are the differences between them. If you need a refresher, feel free to check out the video. Okay, let's get started. The first question is, we ran an experiment where we test the color of a button. The metric we were looking at is the click-through probability. It is calculated as the number of users who click the button over the total number of users. There are a thousand users in both control and treatment groups. Here are the results of the experiment. The control group has 1.1% click-through probability, while the treatment group has 2.3% click-through probability. Can we conclude there's a significant difference between these two groups? Would you recommend launching the experiment? The practical significance boundary is 0.01, and we choose an alpha of 0.05. Let's start with outlining the steps to take to analyze the result. First of all, we want to decide which hypothesis test to use. The diagram we went through in the previous video could serve as a reference. Next, we should be clear on what the null hypothesis of the test is. Then we could evaluate if the test result is statistically significant by comparing the test statistic with the critical value. We also need to check if the result is practically significant by comparing the confidence interval of the estimation with the practical significance boundary. Finally, we can make decisions based on the result. Now, let's go back to the question and analyze the experiment result. Each user is a clicks or not clicks a button, so it's a Bernoulli population. In this case, n times p hat is 11 in the control group and 23 in the treatment group. Both can be considered as large samples. So we choose a z-test. It means that the test statistic, TS, follows a z-distribution or a standard normal distribution. Now we'll measure the users who click in each group, which we will call x-control and x-treatment, as well as the total number of users in each group, which we will call n-control and n-treatment. The estimated probability p of the control group p control hat in this example is 11 over 1000, which is 1.1%. Similarly, we can get p treatment hat is 2.1%. Remember, we want to estimate the difference between p control and p treatment, and I will call this difference d. Under the null hypothesis, p control and p treatment is the same. In other words, d, the true difference is equal to zero. And we would expect our estimation d hat to be normally distributed with a mean of zero. We don't know its standard deviation yet, and we need to estimate it. The test statistic is shown here. Now I'll estimate d hat by subtracting the p control hat from the p treatment hat, and this comes out to 0 0.01. To calculate the standard error of d hat, since we have two samples, we need to choose a standard error that can give us a good comparison of both. We could calculate what is called pooled standard error. To obtain the pooled standard error, the first thing we will calculate is the pooled probability of a click, p hat. And I'm using a hat here because this is an estimated probability. And the pooled probability is the total probability of a click across two groups. That is, the total number of users who click the button divided by the total number of users. Then we can calculate the pooled stand error, which is given by this formula. So the pooled stand error for our experiment comes out to 0 0.00578. Now we can get the value of the test statistic, which is 2.076. Next, we can compare it with the critical z-score values of the alpha equals to 0.05, or a 95% confidence level, which is 1.96. If the test statistic is greater than 1.96, or less than the negative of this cutoff, 
then we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the difference represents a statistically significant difference. In this example, it is larger than 1.96, so the test is statistically significant. We also want to know if the result is practically significant to help us make the decision. To do it, we need to calculate the confidence interval of the estimation. We already know the center of the confidence interval, which is 0 0.012. Let's now calculate the width of the confidence interval, which is also called the margin of error. For the normal distribution, the margin of error m is equal to the z-score of the confidence level times the standard error, which comes to 0 0.0113. So the confidence interval is from 0 0.0007 to 0 0.0233. We can draw a diagram to compare the confidence interval and the practical significance boundary. Here, I've drawn the practical significance boundary as the two dashed lines and zero as this solid line. Our point estimate, which is shown as a solid red circle, is greater than the practical significance boundary. But the left end of the confidence interval is less than the practical significance boundary. This is a tricky case. It means that our best guess, the point estimate, there is a practical significant change. But it's also possible the change is not practically significant. So we are not confident the true change is large enough to be worth launching. So I would not recommend launching the feature. Just to mention, we could also use the confidence interval to check statistical significance. We could check if it overlaps with zero. If it does, it's not statistically significant. The result is the same as comparing test statistic with a critical value. We have just talked about using the z-test to compare two Bernoulli populations and how to determine if the difference is statistically and practically significant. Let's now move forward to the next example. We run an experiment to test if adding a new feature will change the average number of posts created per user. Both control and treatment groups have 30 users. The first array represents the number of posts created by each user in the control group, and the second array has the number of posts created by each user in the treatment group. The control group has a mean 1.4 and the treatment group has a mean 2. Assume variances are similar in the two groups. What conclusion can you draw from this experiment? Shall we launch the feature to all users? The practical significance boundary is 0.05 and we choose an alpha of 0.05. Let's start analyzing. Clearly, we are not dealing with a Bernoulli population and the variances are unknown. Based on the diagram we explained in part 1, we would choose a two-sample t-test to compare the differences between control and treatment. We are told that the population variances in the two groups are similar, so we could calculate the so-called put variance. If the variances in the two groups are different, we will need to obtain the unput unequal variance. We will cover it shortly. Remember our goal here is to measure the difference d between the average number of posts in control mu c and treatment mu t. I call the estimate of d d hat for difference. Under the null hypothesis d, the true difference is equal to zero. The test statistic of a two-sample t-test with pooled variance is given by this formula, where as pool is a pooled standard error. It can be calculated using a formula like this. Here we introduce two more parameters, sum of square ss and degree of freedom df. I will not go through in detail how to get the value of the pooled standard error, but all the numbers are shown here. Feel free to pause the video to derive it and verify your calculation. Now we have the value of the pooled standard error. We can compare the value of the test statistic and the critical t-score value of a 95% confidence level for degree of freedom 58, which is 2.002. The test statistic is larger than 2.002. .002. It means the result is statistically significant. Next, we would construct the confidence interval of d. Similar to the previous example, we could draw a diagram to compare the confidence interval with the practical significance boundary and zero. In this case, 
both ends of the confidence interval were greater than the practical significance boundary. So it's highly possible that the difference of the two means in fact changed by more than the practical significance level. So we would recommend launching the experiment. We have just covered using t-test to compare two samples with similar variances and sample sizes. Let's now look into how to deal with the case that two samples have very different variances or sample sizes. Walters' t-test is used to deal with this scenario. It is an adaptation of students' t-test. It's specific to the case that when the two standard deviations are not similar, specifically when one is more than twice of the other, then the unput stand error is used. We'll calculate the unput stand error instead of the put stand error and it follows this formula. SC and ST are the sample standard deviation of the control group and the treatment group, respectively. The confidence interval of the estimation can then be obtained using this formula. If we compare this scenario with the previous example, where two samples have similar variances, two things are different. One is the standard error and the other one is the degree of freedom. The rest are the same. The form of the degree of freedom is a bit complicated, and you do need to remember it. You only need to know that Welch's t-test is used to deal with such cases, and you could always look up the formula for the calculation. I have just walked you through two examples using hypothesis testing in reality. Hopefully, they are helpful to deepen your understanding of the subject. As always, guys, I appreciate you for taking the time to watch this video. Let me know if you have any questions or feedback. I will see you soon.